Dragon Quest is very much the de facto default template that every Japanese role-playing game uses as a jumping off point. Many games add new gimmicks, different settings and scenarios, but Dragon Quest chooses to keep it simple. The design is not sprawling or complex, it is streamlined and elegant. Each new entry sticks closely to tradition. Even the main creative forces behind the games haven't changed, with creator Yuji Horii, illustrator Akira Toriyama, and composer Koichi Sugiyama being the trio that have worked on every mainline game since the first Dragon Quest in 1986. For fans, Dragon Quest conjures up a sense of magic, of predictability, of cosy vibes and nostalgia even. Yet the release of Dragon Quest VIII is proof that the series does not work purely off nostalgia. You see, I got Dragon Quest VIII shortly after release in April 2006 for my 15th birthday, and this was the very first game in the series to be released in Europe. That's right, for the first 20 years of the Dragon Quest franchise, uh, no European was able to legitimately buy or play a Dragon Quest game, yet when I first saw Dragon Quest I immediately felt a connection with it, and when the older games started to be remade on the Nintendo DS I snapped each of those up as well. But what drew me to Dragon Quest VIII to begin with? What keeps me coming back? Why have I been compelled to complete this 65 hour adventure 5 different times? Why do I own this game on 3 different consoles? Well, in this video I will try and explain that. I will give you 8 reasons why Dragon Quest VIII is the best PS2 RPG, and also why alongside Dragon Quest XI and Mother 3, that Dragon Quest VIII is my favourite Japanese role-playing game. Point 1. The Visuals Dragon Quest VIII is a picture book come to life. I love cell shaded graphics, from Wind Waker and Dark Chronicle to Jet Set Radio Future and Mega Man Legends. Cell shaded graphics allow for more exaggerated locations and character designs. They leave a greater impression on the player because every object, every art asset in the game feels bespoke and tailor made for that game. Each one helps convey the illusion of walking around a 2D animation in a 3D space. Dragon Quest VIII uses cell shaded graphics to create environments and worlds that remain faithful to Akira Toriyama's original illustrations, whilst also using some impressive lighting to convey day and night cycles, as well as lighting being used to convincingly convey the glow from fire. The visuals of Dragon Quest VIII fits hand in hand with my next point. Point 2. The Bestiary like Pokemon and the Shin Megami Tensei series, Dragon Quest has a treasure trove of creature designs, with most games in the franchise sharing from the same pool of beasts, whilst adding a handful of new additions here and there. There's the mascot, the blue slime, the elusive metal slime that can grant the party several levels worth of experience, these puppeteers that can debilitate the party with laughter, these frogs that change faces with each given hit, with their damage output being doubled when their scary face is showing. There are these cool one-eyed monsters holding up a single boot, uh, check out this game's animation from the game's bestiary, oh and check out this animation of an imp trying to perform a magic attack but they've run out of MP, oh and this animation of a hammerhead trying to get back on his feet. It's really impressive that after 20 years of being 2D sprites, this is the first game where these enemies are rendered in 3D. Oh and there's even a monster arena, find these infamous monsters walking around the wild, beat them and they can join you in Mori's monster arena. This side quest helps spotlight these glorious creature designs. Look at these enemies, they're so cute and some of them even have hilarious pun based names like Bagolaths, Mummy Boy, Jargon, The Chainine. Speaking of puns, check out this guy. He's the first boss in the game and he's not feeling too good after he's been hit on the head with a crystal ball. Take a listen. Now, for the moment of news. This be before. Teach you a moron. I mean a lesson. I accept the hands. Or is it Defeat. This brings me nicely onto my next point. Point 3, localization. It is interesting that Dragon Quest is such a quintessential Japanese series because it also feels quite British. I mean I guess that makes sense, you could take the root of western mythology and folklore inspiring Tolkien, which in turn inspired Dungeons and Dragons. That was created in video game form with games like Wizardry, a game that Yuji Horii said was a direct inspiration for Dragon Quest. I guess that's why so many Japanese role-playing games have bars and taverns that feel so closely inspired by British pubs. 
Dragon Quest VIII leans heavily into this lineage. We have these two kids named Bangers and Mash. This villager who says someone is Vavavoom. Vavavoom. And Yangus, this lovable cockney stereotype. He's my favourite party member in any JRPG. Well, until Sylvando came along. <laughs> and each line of his dialogue is laced with these colloquialisms. Yangus even descends from Pickham, a thieves haven whose name works on two levels, being Pickham as in to pickpocket them, and Pickham sounding a lot like the South London district of Peckham, where Only Fools and Horses are set and the place that inspired this song. Point four, voices. The localization works in tandem with the game's exceptional voice acting. Level five, the developers of Dragon Quest VIII, who also made Nino Kuni, Yokai Watch, and the Professor Layton games, always put a lot of effort into their localizations and their voice acting, and this might be their biggest success. The voice cast includes Ricky Grover, who plays Yangus, and is also known for playing Andrew Cotton in EastEnders and Baxter in Red Dwarf. My name is enough to make anyone wet their knickers. That's right! You're talking to none other than Yangus, the legendary bandit himself. And there's also John Glover who plays King Trode and was also one of the five most used impressionists in the decade long run of Spitting Image, which also included other impressionists like Steve Coogan and Harry Enfield. You saying some mini hammer crook from this slum has kidnapped my daughter? Playing the game right now, the voice acting is pretty impressive, but it was truly mind-blowing back in 2006. There was no other game you could compare it to back then, and much like the cel-shaded graphics, the voice acting has aged like a fine wine. Point five and six, the difficulty and the economy. I've lumped these two entries together because they reach the same goal. So in my introduction to this video, I said that Dragon Quest was known for being simple and predictable, that it does not rely on any gimmicks. Aside from a skill point system that gives the player some agency over how proficient different characters are with various weapons, the combat and progression is pretty bare bones. So where's the appeal? How about this? This is the most perfectly pitched and elegant battle system in any JRPG. Why? Well, a big factor is the level of challenge. This game is consistently challenging throughout its runtime. It does require a decent chunk of grinding, it requires thorough exploration of the world and the town maps to find rare ingredients and recipes for the game's alchemy pot, where old weapons can be fused together to make new ones. The game also demands the player is incredibly shrewd and thoughtful with their money. Consumables are expensive and upgrading a character with a new shield or axe can easily bankrupt the party. Each fight feels more meaningful and engaging because all the systems in the game are simple, readable, impactful, they all work together and most importantly they're all fine-tuned to such a staggering degree that the player will always have to make meaningful decisions of what item to buy, what status effect to heal, what skill points each character should invest in. The combat, the progression, the difficulty, the economy, they're all simple but they're elegantly designed, polished to a shine. This is an old school JRPG but it's engineered to perfection and it feels like it's been playtested to death. Dragon Quest proves that if a few core ingredients are good enough JRPGs don't need endless complexity or customization or gimmicks. Point seven, the map. This is a pretty simple entry on the list. Dragon Quest VII, released in 2001 for the PlayStation 1, looked like this. And Dragon Quest VIII looks like this. Most JRPGs on the Super Nintendo had the zoomed out open world maps, and many PlayStation 2 games then downgraded that to menu based maps. But Dragon Quest VIII gives players these expansive verdant hills and valleys and you can explore wherever you want. Players can walk off in any direction, be trampled by enemies twice their level, find treasure hidden from view and wander into a handful of optional locations, dungeons and side quests. Thinking about it now, I am struggling to think of many other games of this generation, or really any generation, that have a realistic to scale open world that the player can walk around in. The Final Fantasy series elected for picturesque but ultimately superficial skyboxes and corridors. The Persona games have you travel by map. Nino Kuni harkens back to the Super Nintendo's zoomed out wall perspective. 
Obviously third person explorable worlds do exist in games and do occasionally appear in JRPGs, but much like the voice acting, they are somewhat rare nowadays and they were even more special back when Dragon Quest VIII was released. All these factors contribute to the feeling that this game is some sort of blockbuster celebration of JRPG polished up to a pristine level. Oh, and what would an old school RPG be without this? Point eight, the guide. Now I cannot speak for other regions, but I do know that in the UK we got this amazing guide that was available to buy upon the game's release. I got my copy with the game on my 15th birthday and it's probably my most prized and cherished gaming possession. Look at this thing, it's glorious. It's full of images of the game, artwork, tips, tables of all the items and all the enemies. The walkthrough is concise and to the point, but it still has a sense of character. There's this cool fold-out map on the back that also acts as a bookmark. And my absolute favourite part is this. The final section of the guide, which is some 20 pages long, is locked off by these perforated edges. This locks off some of the game's late game plots, some of the bosses and some of the secrets, and it is up to the owner to decide when they want to break the seal and look inside. I remember running my finger along the edge, so excited by the possibility of all the secrets contained within those hidden pages. Having that tactile feedback from running my finger up and down the ridges of the perforated edge. Dragon Quest VIII is such a special game and this guide is hands down the best guide I have ever owned. The guide feels like a celebration of Dragon Quest VIII and Dragon Quest VIII feels like a celebration of the series and the series feels like a celebration of Japanese role playing games and role playing games and Japan and Great Britain, of childhood, of fun, of celebration, of imagination. It's just very celebratory. So that's my review, I really hope you enjoyed it, I really enjoyed gushing about this game and gushing about the series as well. This version of the game was released exclusively on the PS2 and has not been re-released since, though it is still pretty inexpensive to buy and fairly easy to emulate. A version of the game was released on the App Store, it is fairly faithful but does lack voice acting. There is also a 3DS version that was released a few years ago, uh, I have this version too. This version is quite different to the PS2 version as there are no random encounters, there are two new party members in the form of Red and Mori, both who appear as non-playable characters in the original game, there are options to speed up the battles which is really really useful, uh, the voice acting is kept intact and there are even some new voice lines added. Graphically the game is very impressive for a Nintendo 3DS game but it still cannot really compare to the PS2 original. Oh and I forgot to mention, the international release of the PS2 game had this really nice orchestral soundtrack, but the app version and the 3DS version uses the original digitised soundtrack from the Japanese release, and well, it isn't as good. In many ways the 3DS version is the best version of the game, it's the most feature rich version of the game, but I still prefer the original release. Ultimately the game is great no matter how you play it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope to see you next time. Bye! See? Two birds with one stone, eh? I ain't just a pretty face. Come on, let's get going south. Pick em, here we come.